Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the stage Paul Osterhout to finish out our Say 27 day. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, I would imagine probably if you're under 50 years old, you've probably never heard the name Paul Harvey. Paul, Paul Harvey was a radio journalist um, out of Chicago. Um, and he would often finish his, his newscasts with a long story, uh, you know, a human-based story. And he would go to commercial, and then he would tell the rest of the story, would give the story a bit of a twist, and he would sign off, and now you know the rest of the story. That's why I chose this picture um, for this eight. Uh, the rest of the story here is the person that turned and said, Paul, that ice cream looks just like you, was a woman named Catherine Griffiths. Now, if you know, if you've been around Sate for any time, you know that Catherine was very um, uh, instrumental in, in the TEA. She served, uh, served on many boards, but she was most proud of the work that she did um, mentoring young students, in particular, young women. Um, unfortunately, Catherine passed away earlier this year. Um, so the Themed Entertainment Association has um, created a scholarship in her name that is awarded, will be awarded every year to a young student for this very conference, for the state conference. And I'm proud to say the first inaugural recipient is Gabriela Gomez. She's here today from USC. And now you know the rest of the story. Um, so when we, we first started gathering all of the uh, submissions for this conference, um, this next one was one of the very first ones. We said, yes, we have to do this one. Um, it, it was sounded so cool, uh, the way it was written and the way they, they thought about presenting it. Brent Young and Robert Corker are the creative director and senior show writer, respectively, at Super 78, a creative design and production studio, enjoying its 20th anniversary this year. The two have worked together on Wings Over Washington and Alpha Flight, the company's most recent flying theater attractions, and Reef Rescue VR, de de debuting this November at no New Orleans Audubon Aquarium, the SpongeBob Subpants Adventure, and in their words, a whole bunch of other fun stuff. Um, Brent and Robert are also co-hosts of the Season Past broadcast. Brent, Robert, come on up. Introduce your panel. Wow. Are we good? Yeah, we're good. We're All, All right, right. there oh we go. Gosh. Hi, howdy. I'm Brent. I'm sheriff of this whole stage today. And I'm Robert, deputy at your service, and welcome to Westworld from screen to reality. Oh, yeah, there it is. All right, this afternoon we're going to be talking about an obscure 1970s sci fi film that transformed itself into an HBO series that is now a worldwide mega hit. I want to know how many out there are watching this show. Come on, let's do All right. big round of Super applause. awesome, super cool. And before we get into it, I want to give a big shout out and a thank you to the third member of our posse, Doug Barnes of the Season Pass, doing all the state coverage here. That's right. Doug thank Barnes, you, Doug. yeah. There you go. All right. And speaking of the Season oh, Pass, you know, I'm going to stand over here yeah, if you yeah, don't yeah, mind. Speaking of the Season Pass, uh, in an interview with our friend Tony Baxter, he made a comment that was really profound, and I'm going to put it up here. He said that science fiction writers don't predict the future. They create a vision of the future that's so cool that when kids grow up, they want to make this stuff, right? Exactly. Yeah, so books by Jules Verne, Isaac Asimov, Brad Burry, all these, uh, all these authors created visions of the future that were so, you know, kids, like they, they presented a vision of technology that we have now or will soon have. So, of course, some of them also imagined futures where that technology backfired pretty hard. Right, so the modern master of this kind of story was, of course, Michael Crichton, the writer who brought us both Jurassic Park and Westworld, right? <laughs> Probably two of the most famous stories about theme parks ever created, except for maybe this one. <laughs> And of course, they had the good sense to close this park when things broke down, but that's, that's right. Story. Yeah. So Michael Crichton was a true Renaissance man. You might not know this, but he was top of his class in Harvard as a medical student. Uh, he got his MD. He was a computer programmer. He was a game creator. He was a teacher. He was a writer. He was a producer. And of course, he was a director. 
Right. And you know, he fine-tuned that whole, hey, it's all wonderful. And then something goes horribly wrong storyline that we all know so well. I mean, how many theme park attractions hang their premise on that very idea? So. Right, exactly. So... And so that's why the 1973 Westworld film has become such a legendary pop culture touchstone, written and directed by Crichton, by the way. That's right. So according to Crichton, the genesis of this idea came from a visit to NASA, where he witnessed the training of the astronauts, and he saw the computer control rooms. And so you can imagine, like, the backstage of uh, Westworld really has that feel. And then he had a trip to Disneyland, and he saw Mr. Lincoln, believe it or not. He took those two concepts, he mashed them up, and he created... Westworld. Now, I'm going to show you a clip from the original 1973 movie that really illustrates these two concepts put together, plus the something will go terribly wrong. <laughs> so we're going to play this. Enjoy. And I'm responding. Should we cut the main power grid, sir? That'll kill the life. Shut it all system. down. Shut it all down. <laughs> you again. It's too early. Let me do it this time. Your move. I'm shot. What? I'm shot. Right, pretty Damn. intense. If you haven't seen that movie before, it's amazing. Yul Brenner, uh, the gunslinger, plays what clearly was the precursor to the Terminator or Blade Runner or any of these movies. Yeah, I mean, I remember seeing that scene when I was a little kid, scared the hell out of me, because this was like, oh, technology can really hurt you. That's not good. No, no, no. So... But now, coming to today, Thanks to the HBO sequel series, Westworld has become the new short description of, for deeply immersive real experiences. And uh, that show starts with the film's basic premises and is going much deeper into questions that we, as an industry, all face. Yeah, uh, Joe, can you please scroll the, the uh, text, please? Um, who will be the true game authors of these attractions and experiences? Will the narrative that are customized by, for the guests be created by us, or are they going to be created by the computers? And as robotics and machine learning evolve to create artificial hosts that are essentially indistinguishable from humans, how much autonomy and ability do we really want to give them? So how far do we go to challenge the social norms, to up the ante, to keep the guests coming back for more. Think about what we considered graphic violence 30 years ago, and what we consider graphic violence today. Do these violent delights have violent ends? And are we just being creative or blindly following the path that Crichton laid down for us? Yeah, these are the questions that we're going to answer today. Are we on the path to a West world? Is that going to eventually happen? And is that a good thing? And of course, the other question is, Brent, how are we going to pay for all this? Um, <laughs> I think he's talking about the alcohol. All right. Of course. <laughs> when, how, and why, that's what we're going to discuss. And we have four amazing guests that are going to help us uh, get to the answers. We're going to bring them out one at a time. Uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit. They're going to tell us about their unique perspectives. And then we're going to open it up to a little bit of a discussion. 
That's right. So the first person we're going to bring out, Steve Teague. Steve is the uh, CTO of Xperi, a global technology company where he leads strategy and machine learning initiatives. He has invented highly influ inf bleh, influential technologies ranging from chip design and computer architecture to pharmaceutical discovery and machine learning. Steve received a World Technology Award and an Edison Award in 2011 and is an inventor listed on 315 U.S. patents. Steve, come on up. Come on up. Here we go. Let me pass the baton to you, sir. There you go. Thank nice. you very much. Well, I'm very glad to have the opportunity to speak at this uh, conference today. I've been a technologist my whole life, but really I've always wanted to direct, so I'm, I'm glad to have this chance. Uh, the, the organizers asked me a very difficult question, which is, how far are we from creating intelligent beings of this sort that we might see in Westworld? And my simple answer to that complex question is we're still pretty far. Yes, I see, trying to get a sense of how this works. Uh, yes, we can see that moonshot from here, but we're going to have to invent a whole bunch of technologies we don't have any idea how to build yet in order to get from here to there. Now, yes, I recognize as well as you do that uh, Alexa and Siri are tremendously impressive technologies already, and it's easy to be fooled that artificial intelligence must be just over the next hill if we can already build that stuff. But I believe that's just an illusion. Yes, we've built some incredibly impressive technologies, some miracles so far. However, in my opinion, we're still decades away, not centuries, but decades away, and we're gonna to have to invent a whole bunch of additional technologies, technologies we can only barely imagine today to get from here to something that really feels like a Westworld. So let's dive into this a little bit more. We should first take credit for solving some impossible problems already. The fact is that if you were to ask the computer science community 20 years ago, build us a system that, given photographs, can distinguish whether the photograph has a flower or an elephant or an aircraft carrier, I can tell you we would have had no idea how to solve this problem 20 years ago, how to begin approaching it. And yet, over the last three or four years, that problem has been solved to a level that's almost as good as humans can solve this problem. I can tell you that my own team at Xperi has been able to build technology that runs on a cell phone where we can uh, examine in real time all of the humans in the image, figure out wh where their left eye, right eye, left knee, right knee, how it is they're articulated, how they're moving, even the reflections in, in windows all being done in real time. This is stuff that would have seemed like witchcraft even 10 years ago and yet is doable today. So we've certainly made a tremendous amount of progress. With that said, it's not all rosy. Here are some pictures from a system that Google has. So Google can analyze uh, an image and discriminate any of thousands of different kinds of objects, some of which you can see in the left column of this picture uh, behind me. However, if you mischievously and very carefully perturb the colors in some of the pictures in those images, to transforming the left column into the right column, those transformations are so subtle that the human eye can't even detect that the right pictures are different from the left pictures, and yet the Google system will then be absolutely certain that every one of those pictures is a picture of an ostrich. So, <laughs> not only do these systems make mistakes, blunders, but they do it in a way that's so far away from how we think of a sentient organism behaving. So, we're still some significant distance from building something that would really be artificial intelligence. Yes, we have machine learning, but we don't have artificial intelligence, at least not yet. So part of the reason that I think that is that we're still missing some of the fundamentals that an intelligent system would have to have. Things like long-term memory, uh, emotion, desire. Yes, today's computers can do a great job of distinguishing pictures of puppies from pictures of kittens, but don't have the ability to remember that, oh, that kitten looks like something I saw in a commercial two weeks ago, or looks like your grandmother's kitten. Yes, we have a computer that can outplay the world's best Go player at Go. Super impressive. But that computer doesn't want to play Go. It doesn't realize that Go is fun. Similarly, that system can outplay even the most gifted teenager at Breakout. But in order to play Breakout, you need only about a second of history so you know where the ball is moving. It knows nothing whatsoever about what happened three seconds ago, or ten minutes ago, or in the Renaissance, or in ancient Greece. So we have no idea yet, as a community of technologists, how to represent a complex history, a lifetime, if you will, that has the context for how it is one should interact with the world. And that's one of the big gulfs between where we are and the system that at least I would call uh, intelligent. So let's see where we are. So with that said, 
I see a deep reason for optimism. It's one of the reasons that I think we are on, a, on the path to being able to build systems like this over the course of the next several decades. And it's because I think we have a hint for one of the steps, for one of the first steps we're going to need to take towards getting from where we are with machine learning and the technology we have to something that's real artificial intelligence. And interestingly, it's from a comment that was made by a Nobel Prize winning economist, Herbert Simon, back in 1969, that I believe to be the most intelligent thing, the most the smartest thing anybody has said yet about artificial intelligence. And in fact, one of the very few really smart things anybody has said so far about artificial intelligence. So I'm going to quote it verbatim because I think it's really quite illuminating. What he said was, the ant behaving as, as, a, as a behaving system is quite simple. In other words, the ant is a pretty simple little robot. The apparent complexity of its behavior over time is largely a reflection of the complexity of the environment in which it finds itself. In other words, if you take a really simple robot, but you put it in a very complex world, it's going to behave in a complex way because it's in a complex world. And in fact, if you take a simple robot and you put it in a sea of a whole bunch of other simple robots, like the ant colony, the aggregate complexity of the environment of a bunch of other simple robots makes this simple robot behave in a complex way. But Simon's pièce de résistance is, I should like to explore this hypothesis with the word man substituted for ant. In other words, we're really simple robots also, but if you put us in a sufficiently complicated world, we give the illusion of behaving in a pretty complex way. And in fact, if you put this simple robot in a sea of a bunch of other simple robots, the aggregate complexity of those other simple robots drives us to behave in a complex way. Ironically, this brings us back to Westworld, that part of the way I think we're going to get to an artificial intelligence is by taking the technologies, the machine learning technologies, out of the Google data center where they're hidden away, out of the Facebook data center, and out in the real world, by having a zillion of these still very simplistic agents. By dint of those simplistic agents being exposed to the complex world and being exposed to each other, that's what's going to force those simple agents to begin to develop memory, intent, emotion, and give us the very first steps towards something that might look like artificial intelligence over the next years. That's all I have. Thanks. All right, cool. Very right, cool. So, Steve, real quick question before I bring up the next panelist. Um, obviously, getting to a fully sentient robot that is going to be indistinguishable from a human. We may be many decades away from that, but the character in the Westworld film, the gunslinger, very simple, a very limited set of baked in behaviors. He just does the one kind of thing. Like how far do you think we are from something like that? I really think the key to that question is what the expectations are of the person interacting with it. If you expect it to behave like a video game character and you don't expect it to be, to be fully sentient, well, you can interact with it and have fun and have it do interesting things, surprising things, as a video game character. I think to the extent the human's expectations are, this thing is actually fully sentient, I can treat this like another human, I think that, that the mistakes it makes will be jarring and weird for some time to come. Right. Okay. All right. All right. Thank cool. you very much. Thanks. So next up, we have somebody you all know, uh, Garner Holt. So he is the founder and president of Garner, Garner Holt Production. He is a leading designer of animatronics for theme parks worldwide. Let's welcome Garner Holt. There you go. I love this. Here you go. Here's your clicker. Just advance right there. Very good. Hello. I mean, you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, um, thank you for having me and uh, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here today. Um, Garner Holt Productions is an animatronics company based here in Southern California. Um, we just celebrated our 40th anniversary, which is cool, this is July 25th. Um, oh, thank you. Um, when I was a snotty kid 40 years ago in the garage trying to do what I saw at Disneyland, obviously Walt and Disney was my inspiration. Um, part of my inspiration was also Westworld. And you'll notice on my hand-drawn card that I did in my garage, my <laughs> homage to Yul Brenner there to the right, um, you'll see that uh, uh, I, he was a great influence and the Westworld movie was a great influence because I'm like, wow, it's on screen. This is the world I want to live in. This is the world I want to build. So between Disney and Westworld, this is what was a great inspiration to me to get Garner Holt Productions off the ground. And uh, I have a little bit of a slide or a, a, a video here that uh, talks a little bit about some of the advancements that we've made in the recent past uh, pertaining to animatronics. So I think it uh, should run here. I clicked twice.
animatronics are all about creating realistic expression through mechanical means. At Garner Holt Productions, we've been blurring the line between what's mechanical and what's real for 40 years. In parks and attractions all over the world, our thousands of animatronics tell stories, give life and vibrancy to environments, and perform in roles of all shapes and sizes. In 2010, GHP began a new initiative with the U.S. Department of Defense to replace live actors in immersive training environments with animatronics to better equip Marines and soldiers with cultural awareness training before deploying to combat zones. From this ongoing research and development project, we introduced new technologies and techniques, advanced electric figures, new AI-based control systems and environmental awareness hardware, and facial expression capability to show trainees who was friendly and who was a potential enemy. In our ongoing R&D efforts, GHP built on things learned in our military work to create an expressive human figure unlike anything the world has ever seen. The result reflects 40 years of expansive theme park animatronic knowledge, combining exceptional engineering and design with unmatched realism and production quality. GHP's Expressive Head project pushes the art and technology of animatronics and human robotics one step closer to achieving a true sense of mechanism come to life. The effect is nothing short of magical. We call them the living faces of history. 48 individual miniature motors combine to make a broad range of expressions matching what a real person can do, from silly to serious, thoughtful to distrusting, flirtatious to surprised, all through silent, cool, and durable materials. It's the face of animatronics to come, well-designed, carefully built, and remarkably alive. Thank you. Thank you. As uh, mentioned there, uh, a lot of development came from the military projects that we've done. Uh, with the Army and Navy. Um, actually, it's very close to a Westworld, in a sense. <clears throat> you can actually um, enter this facility, if you're a soldier in training, you can uh, interact with these characters, which are animatronic, which uh, prior to our characters, they just had avatars on the wall, which were uh, films of combatants and uh, terrorists and so forth. And uh, they found that the soldiers were not taking this seriously because you can't, you know, have much effect through a film on the wall. So as we started to put animatronic characters in there that you can actually shoot, if you hit them in a kill zone in the head or the body, they'll actually reel and they'll fall down on the ground dead. You can actually take the weapons away from them and check them in a number of ways to see if they're actually dead as a human would be. Um, <clears throat> they'll pop back up later and uh, continue to fight. Um, but the soldiers have, uh, in experiencing these things, have experienced something that they're not sure what they're going to do. So if you walk into a room with one of these things, you don't know if it's going to run at you, which some of them do. You don't know if it's going to pull a knife or um, if it's going to pull a gun. Or it can be an expressive uh, character in a fruit stand, let's say, and he could be very friendly and welcome you, and then all of a sudden his expression turns mean and you know something's going to happen and then maybe he pulls a, a weapon or something or he we have uh, characters that actually lob grenades uh, about 40 feet into a group of people um, so it's very westworld like in a sense you can talk to these characters they are kind of uh, puppeteered in a way although we are developing things that they mentioned siri and a lot of those things we're trying to work with how to make these things more interactive and more real in the sense that we have uh, developed methods of having figures lock onto you eye to eye. They can see your face, they can lock to you, and they can follow you around. And basically, um, they know you're there, they can identify you, they have the facial recognition capabilities, so they can know who you are. So we actually see things um, moving forward in the world that maybe in the theme park industry that 
Um, you might, uh, in like the Pirates of the Caribbean, you know, you pass the passive pirate characters. Well, there might be a day come that um, because of the RFID ticket or something in your pocket that has the information about you, that as you pass a particular pirate, rather than just standing there and waving a sword around, he might choose you off and say, you know, I, Billy Smith, how about a sword fight? You know, and look straight at you, look straight at Billy when he says that. So that is an interactive uh, potential for the uh, entertainment industry, which we hope to see someday. Um, these are our living faces of history, as mentioned with the Lincoln Project um, and the Expressive Head Project. We have a number of characters that have expressive capability with hundreds of thousands of potential expressions with 40, 40 to 45 different motors uh, in the head. And uh, we're doing all kinds of different characters and so forth. Um, we're really excited about the future and uh, we are excited about the potential of having more interactivity with animatronics in the theme park industry and uh, other industries working in the medical fields. We also work in the prosthetic uh, realm. <clears throat> the uh, fun thing about all this, enjoying Westworld when I was a, a kid and having such inspiration, uh, when they were building the, or getting ready to do the Westworld movie, um, they heard about us and they came to us and looked through our shop and all the set people went crazy and said, we've got to have all of this and, you know, in the movie. And uh, I, so I told them, I said, well, uh, the price is here if you just rent everything, but it's here if I get to be in the movie. So, <laughs> so, uh, so here I am as a technician in the... Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Garner, real quick. Uh, um, Quick question. Alongside Anthony Hopkins as a technician in the film, it's great fun and it was worth every yeah. dime that uh, they didn't pay me. So, <laughs> so there you go. Thank you very much. Garner, we have a quick question for you. Just about um, you know the future of animatronics. Now on the show, we see that they they can uh, walk around autonomously. They move. They have their lightweight as far as the skeletons they use, or they uh, show a lot of 3D printing and they uh, how they do it. You know, for the muscles and the and the armatures. Where, how far away are we from that? Well, as this gentleman said, we're, we're, we're a long ways away, but we, we can simulate a lot of things. Now, we could, we could create a West world in a sense that, you know, was kind of the early stages. I mean, probably like your Disney dark rides were and, you know, uh, as compared to the way they are now, you know, I think with some of the tricks that we have, you know, the, the, you know if you'd walk through our Afghani village and see a lot of the things that we have there, you'd almost feel like you're in a West world. These things are trying to kill you and, you know, their people are being trained on what they're going to find in the real world. Um, so, but to actually walk around, you know, they have bipedal things that actually walk and Raytheon and other companies develop those things. I mean, eventually they'll merge into realistic characters and eventually they'll tie into the, the series and things of the world and we have some AI capability and we're trying to do some of that too. And uh, hopefully it'll all meld together someday and we'll have something really, right. really cool. And hopefully, hopefully or hopefully not. I don't know. You're know. scaring we'll, me. We'll, we'll get to that. <laughs> In fact, this is about the right time for me to take my face off and show all the <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not really. All right. Thank all you right. very much, Thank Garner. You. Thank you. All right. So now we've got another great guest, another great friend of the season past, Jeff Tucker. Jeff has been in the theme park industry for over 20 years. As a member of the creative team at Knott's Berry Farm, he has been involved in the creation of numerous iconic shows and attractions, including many for the legendary Knott's Scary Farm, now enjoying another awesome run, and Trapped, the groundbreaking experience that helped usher in the current wave of escape rooms. Jeff Tucker, come on up. <laughs> There you go, sir. Thank you. It's great to be here. Hey, forget Westworld. Can we get a monorail from Buena Park to here? <laughs> it took me two hours to get here. And just like on Westworld, you ask the person in the car next to you, they just ignore you. <laughs> so here I am. Yes, I work at Knott's Berry Farm during the day, as you can see. Uh, we had our own version of Westworld right here. It was called Ghost Town Alive. Uh, it's run two years now. And while my part in Ghost Town Alive was very small, uh, it was very vital because I would talk to the actors every day. And my job was to write the correspondence that the actors were then having guests take from here to there, which is groundbreaking because guests like to have a soda, have a churro, 
and watch things. And we were having none of that. The wall was gone. They were in an immersive, completely immersive ghost town experience. And they would take the letter and the letter would go to another character. And I spent, no joke, I spent three months writing these letters because it wasn't enough to just write them on the computer. I then had to write them in longhand with the calligraphy pen because they had to look, period. And they also had to have feminine handwriting and masculine handwriting. So <laughs> it was very involved, but it was very important to the experience because everything in Ghost Town Alive was real and immersive. And just like the robots on uh, Westworld, uh, they ignored any kind of outside interference that, in that interfered with the storyline. You know, a lot of guests, hey, I got my cell phone. Oh, hey, here's a letter for you. So it was very interesting. And I give full credit to uh, Ken Parks and the creative team who spent literally years working on this concept. And as you can see, uh, guests were completely immersed in it from park opening until 5.30 at night. And we had multiple guests who would come every single day of the summer. Uh, when this ended on Labor Day, guests were crying. Uh, even though It was like the end of summer camp and they'd have to wait a whole year until it came back again. So it was very exciting to be a part of. But I'm also, uh, this is my big thing. I love Not Scary Farm. I work it year round. We're in the middle of it right now. So if I sound a little tired, I've been working two, three, four, five in the morning. So uh, Not Scary Farm, as you can see here, I was the guy who came up with this crazy concept. Uh, I came up with it years ago. I said, we need to come up with a way to take the guests in our themed mazes where they're having a personal, immersive, interactive experience and they don't see anybody else because a lot of these attractions become conga lines where you can see five groups ahead and you can see the scare and what's going on. Oh, the next room is really cool. Instead, with Trap, the idea was to put them in a room with no obvious way out and they would have to do tasks, complete puzzles to get out. Uh, this was met with a lot of skepticism because we'd have to do it as an upcharge and we didn't want to do it for years. And finally, somebody said, hey, we're having a big brainstorming meeting. No idea is too crazy. And I was like, I've got a crazy idea that everyone's told me to shut up about. And it was trapped. So we charged $60 for a group of six to go through. So it was $10 a person if you had a group of six. We did have a lot of people who came alone, which I thought was odd. $60 to me is pricey, but $10, I can do that. So as you can see, uh, they were expecting uh, the royal treatment and instead they got live rats, which they had to interact with and a, lot, and a giant full-size rat cage that rained rat droppings down on their heads. <laughs> and then they met mama in the kitchen where, and you can see that the whole idea behind Trapped, I'll go back and forth here. This was Mama's kitchen in the light, and this is what it looked like during the show. And as you can see by that woman in the center, this was not about getting scared. This was about a real situation with real stress. And the real stress here is, see, this woman, I know her personally, she's a vegetarian. <laughs> And she was not allowed to leave this room till she ate a cockroach, not a cockroach, a, a feeder cricket, I'm sorry. A feeder cricket which was basted with uh, nacho cheese like Doritos. And uh, <laughs> as you can see, the actors would zero in on the one person who was having the problem and make them eat and everybody else was fine. So they're trying to get her to eat that there. Oh, there they are. <laughs> Delicious, right? Delicious. We started off the first weekend uh, by also giving them uh, what they thought was spoiled milk, which was actually warm buttermilk with cottage cheese in it. <laughs> <laughs> but after too many um, expulsions, <laughs> it was holding up my line, so we cut it. <laughs> Got to keep it flowing, right? So there we are. There they are deciding, and they're all going to eat one there. And we learned so many lessons on Trap. Trap ran three years at Not Scary Farm. Uh, the third year was the pinnacle of it. And the ultimate compliment I got was uh, we were trying to devise a, a Halloween experience that would be above anything you'd ever experience at a theme park. And the ultimate compliment was I had created an experience that was if you look at Trapped 1 and 2, they were 18 minutes and 7 minutes. They were really short. The third year was close to a half an hour, which under full stress is a long time. And the season pass went through, and they recorded it on their recorder for their show. And afterwards, Doug came up to me and he said, Jeff, uh, I'm really embarrassed to tell you this, but we're a little upset. It was only like 10 minutes. And I said, Doug, 
check the tape. And it was 28 minutes on the tape, wasn't it? <laughs> so 28 minutes had gone by and it felt like 10. So that was the ultimate compliment. And uh, of course the goal eventually is to take all the actors out of it and replace it with uh, synthetic robots, but we'll let Garda Holt get to that. <laughs> all, right. all right. Thank you. So, Jeff, well, another quick question. I mean, again, you were involved for all three years in some capacity. What was the most surprising thing you learned about guest interaction in your trapped experience? Okay, the most surprising thing I learned was I, I am surrounded by people who love Halloween. So I'm always surprised when people who come to the event are like, well, I don't really like Halloween. What are you doing here? <laughs> I'm always surprised by that. And if you look at the two versions of Westworld, uh, now we did this years ago, this is before Westworld. The first Westworld is about technology run amok and the robots are gonna get you. And the new Westworld was, hey, the robots are fine, it's the humans that are the bad guys because they're destroying the robots and shooting them and raping them and all these terrible things, right? So we flipped the script in Trapped and instead of the maze being inhabited with monsters, the guests didn't realize that by the final two rooms, they were the monsters. And we had put a plant in the, in, the, in the attraction that was pleading for help. I've lost my boyfriend. I can't find my way out. And they kept meeting this person through the maze. I thought, they're going to see through this in a heartbeat. <laughs> No way. They bought it hook, line, and sinker. The finale room opened, and she was in a noose. And we invited the guest to pull the lever to hang her. And I thought, this is cool. People are going to love this. <laughs> Get to pull the lever. Nine out of ten groups completely refused. I am not doing it. And I was really shocked at that because I thought, it's Halloween, everybody's game. But it was nice to see humanity still reigns supreme. <laughs> so it was very nice. So Thank that you. was the lesson learned. Thank you. Uh, I don't know what I do now. There we go. So we have uh, a really interesting gentleman coming up next. He is the CEO and president of World Builder Inc. Uh, he focuses on the development of games and attraction design. He's been working in the VR space, and most recently, he's been at Disney Consumer Products, uh, developing a very cool. Um, uh, uh, I guess you would call it toy for this season, <laughs> right? Which Very I think, cool toy. I think it's it. probably going to be the one of the biggest sellers of the season. It's a Star Wars augmented reality lightsaber uh, 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 experience, I guess. And here we go, we've got Michael Libby. Come on up, Come Michael. On, Michael. Okay, uh, hi everybody. Uh, we're almost done for the day, but thank you for your attention. I'm happy to be here. Um, and I'm here to talk about a new type of job in our industry, sort of a new category of job. Uh, and it's so new that it doesn't really have an official job title yet. Um, and it's like a writer, but not quite. Uh, and some people call it a narrative designer. Some people call it a game designer. Some people call it a game developer, an interactive consultant, or a procedural storyteller but there's no real word for it yet, because it's so new. Um, in Westworld, it's a character named Lee Sizemore, and uh, he's the, the head of narrative, uh, the head of the narrative department. He comes up with all the storylines for the games, and he's the game maker. But Lee Sizemore is indicative of a larger problem in Hollywood, which is that Hollywood filmmakers don't actually know what game designers do. <laughs> they have no idea. And game designers, as depicted in Hollywood, fall under one of two categories. Either they are the uh, sort of omnipotent, egotistical master game maker with an attitude, or the nerdy loser who lives in his parents' basement. Uh, and if you don't believe me, I, uh, I spend way too much time on this, but I assembled a little <laughs> supercut of game designers as depicted in Hollywood. <laughs> Start. Do you know who I am? I am the architect. The world's greatest game designer. Plutarch Heavensby, head game maker. Lee, Lee Sizemore, head of narrative. Well, JP is not normal. 
He created the original Eternal Death Slayer when he was only 13. He's the definition of a prodigy. This park is my stage, and I shall do with it what I please. This is the prototype. I think this is some of your best work. We sell complete immersion in a hundred interconnected narratives. It's an entirely new game system. That's what we game makers like to call a wrinkle. All I ever cared about were video games, and they've made me a millionaire. Years of my life squeezed down to the essence, the raw pulp of truth, my truth. In one transcendent narrative. When this new villain comes up, you're gonna run from the room in a panic. I'm gonna make this game and it's gonna be the best thing that anyone has ever seen. Tracy, what are you doing? They need you in wardrobe. I'm inventing a porn video game. Let this man work. No one is to disturb him. I'm the head game maker. Fun is my job. The best programmer income ever saw and he winds up playing space cowboy in some back room. I was in the middle of another huge breakthrough with the new game. How's it looking? It's the future of gaming. What precisely is the goal of the game that we're playing now? You have to play the game to find out why you're playing the game. It's how you play the game. There are things that have to be said to advance the plot and establish the characters, and those things get said whether you want to say them or not. Not everything is a part of this game. Then you don't see the whole game. Whatever game you think you're playing, those out there are not playing it with you. I was very disturbed by the game we just played. On with the game! You said this place was a game. Last night I finally understood how to play it. Have I won? Have I won the game? Game. Hey, tell me the truth. Are we still in the game? Well, so that's my game. <laughs> And uh, you know what? I have a little more work to do, so if you want to just uh, get... Uh, wait your turn. I'm on a roll here. Ooh, take that, you dirty dopers. <laughs> so that's, that's my job. Um, and the thing is that Hollywood doesn't understand what a game designer does because they're so used to creating linear stories. Um, but what they're not realizing, whoa, I gotta keep my balance here, is that uh, Hollywood is changing and entertainment is changing. And we used to have the star system where people went to go see movies for stars. But that changed a little bit and people got more interested in characters and actors were less important. And you could see multiplicity of character. You could see different actors playing the same character like Batman or James Bond. It didn't really bother people. And now we're entering this new era of story world immersion where people go to see the movies as part of a larger transmedia experience uh, to immerse themselves in the story. And even though the films are the tent poles, that's really only the tip of the iceberg. Um, and social media, when you think about it, is about constant connection, but in a non-fiction way. Story world immersion is about constant connection in a fictional setting, and that's the difference. Um, and the entire appeal of Westworld is story world immersion, is immersion in fiction. I'm going to touch on something uh, Jason, the last speaker, said about um, letting the user tell the story with you. And this is a concept called the spectrum of authorship. And this is one of the things that a game designer really understands and has to decide where is the experience that you're creating going to fall on the spectrum. On one extreme end, we have authorial masterpieces. You know, we have J.K. Rowling, we have F. Scott Fitzgerald, we have amazing linear narratives. On the complete opposite side of the spectrum, we have no narrative at all, but extreme interactivity. We have complete systems. The Sims, SimCity, Legos, where there's no story, people can create their own stories. But it's not binary, it's a spectrum. Where do you fall on the spectrum? And uh, when it comes to video games, it's such a new medium that we're still learning and we're seeing that these things are opposing at all times. Take the Uncharted series, one of the more popular game uh, series. The gameplay is very much action-based. You're shooting, you're getting points, you're killing enemies and all these things, but there's no story. The story comes in the cinematic cutscenes where you don't interact, where you don't play any gameplay at all. You're just watching things unfold and not interacting. So those two things are always at odds on the spectrum. And a game designer will help you figure out where to fall on that spectrum for the type of experience you're trying to create. A game designer will also help you figure out if you even want to make a game or if you should make a game. Just because you want to have an interactive experience doesn't mean it has to be a game. 
Um, and a game is not appropriate for all IPs. Games are competitive sometimes. Figure out first if you want to make a toy or a puzzle instead. Take that same bucket of Legos. It's a toy, you can build anything. The second it comes with a set of instructions to build a specific thing, it becomes a puzzle. It's the same form factor, but figure out what you want to build. A game designer understands the concept of the magic circle. Uh, in games and digital media alike, this is the space in which the normal rules and reality of the world are suspended and replaced by the artificial reality of a game world. It's a shield that protects the fantasy world from the outside world. When you're in the real world, you kick a ball into a net, it goes into the net. In, once you step into the magic circle of a soccer field and you kick a ball into a net, you get a point because you've entered the magic circle, the space where the game takes place. And we consent. We, we willingly buy the game. We accept these rules. Life is really hard. It has a lot of choices, a lot of things to think about. When we step into the magic circle, there are only three things to think about, four things to think about, and those are the rules of the game. And this is something, as experienced designers, we already do. The berm is a magic circle. We step in, we accept these constraints, we wait in lines. We pay money to go wait in line and pay ridiculous prices for food. Why? Because we're in the magic circle. Um, yesterday, uh, I believe it was John Snotty, showed a slide of Storybook Land, Monstro the Whale, the big text that said immersion. And he said, he, he was making the point that maybe that's a little dated and we're a little more sophisticated, but I might disagree because we're in the magic circle already. We've entered the park and we're willing to be immersed. So everyone there is consenting to the rules of the magic circle and saying, yeah, I want to play in this fantasy, in this fictional world. And Monstro, of course, is almost a circle within a circle because when you go through the whale's mouth, you're in a concentric circle that introduces new rules. Oh, things are small, we're on a boat. Kind of crazy. A game designer will help you understand throughput versus agency. The more people that can play simultaneously, the less individual effect you have on the outcome. Uh, over here, you'll see uh, the, the queue for Soren, where a lot of people are crowdsourcing something, but it's very difficult for one person to see the individual impact that they're having on what's going on on screen. But it's very high throughput. On the other side of the spectrum here, you have the Wizarding World Wands, which is one-to-one. -one. Intense, extreme agency. You, f you know that you're doing that thing because you did it, but there's a huge line of people behind you waiting to do it. And one of the best examples of this that I've ever seen, Toy Story Mania. I mean, this has a THRC of, I don't know, 1,300, 1,400. It loads eight guests at a time, but after the vehicle dispatches and they rotate, all of a sudden, it's just two guests facing one screen. So it's a two-to-one ratio, throughput versus agency. A game designer will also help you understand the difference between characters and avatars. If you're playing a video game, yeah, it's cool if you, if, you, know, you can be Luke Skywalker. That's awesome. But in a theme park setting, when thousands of people are coming at the same time, they can't all be Luke Skywalker. They can't. It's not going to work. Um, so instead, maybe create a system within the constraints of the magic circle where people can customize and create their own character to fulfill that story world immersion. A game designer will help you understand that interactivity does not equal repeatability. This is why we need to strive for what's called meaningful play. And this is the thing that will get guests to keep coming back. Meaningful play will make things repeatable. Meaningful play happens when you have ludonarrative harmony. It's a really big word, I'm going to break this down. Narrative, you know, means story. Ludo means game. Ludonarrative har harmony happens when the game and the story match and shake hands. Um, the best example I've ever seen of this is not digital, it's a board game. It's called Meltdown. And it's a board game that's meant to teach kids about climate change with a board that freezes and melts as you're playing on it. So the mechanic of the game is directly matching the content of the game. And famously, this concept was coined uh, by a game um, uh, writer, uh, whose name is out of focus, so I don't remember. Uh, but uh, it was about Bioshock, and that it's, it's, the game is about this exploration of the city that, that was selfish, 
like ancient Rome or Atlantis, and it fell because of its selfishness, and you're exploring its ruins as a cautionary tale. But the interactivity is completely selfish. You're leveling up, you're getting better weapons and armor only for yourself. So those two things create a ludonarrative dissonance. And that will bring you out of the game. That will bring you out of the immersive experience that you're in if you, if you can just subconsciously feel that dissonance. Um, as experienced designers, this is actually something that we're already doing. Again, there are a lot of similarities here. Uh, and we do it without even thinking. If a ride takes place in outer space, it makes sense that we should be riding in a spaceship. Like, this is literally what we do. If a ride takes place in the world of cars, it makes sense for us to ride in a car. These things, when they work, they're transparent. When they don't work, they're jarring. And if we're you know, battling killer steel robots with respect to our friends down the street, maybe don't make it the only wooden coaster in the park. <laughs> um, Ludonarrative harmony. This is what you're striving for. This is a girl wanting to be a wizard. How do you be a wizard? You cast spells with a wand. It's common sense. It's only jarring when you have to do something else to become a wizard. Just swinging a fish around or doing something, or a fire hose, right? That would be silly, but that would be ludonarrative dissonance. This is a photo I took at an unnamed museum. <laughs> this is ludonarrative dissonance. You don't smell a smell by pushing a button. You smell a smell by smelling. That's ludonarrative harmony. Ludonarrative dissonance, this is a very new field of study, actually, is... Uh, is actually also being used strategically for storytelling. We've talked this entire conference about immersion, but we haven't talked about the opposite, immersion. And this is something, just for example, this is, a, again, very new, but um, what you're seeing is, for example, drone operators purposefully doing things that are different from immersing themselves in the drone experience. They're not in a motion-based cockpit. They're not using a joy joystick, they're using a keyboard, and that's to immerse them, because they don't want to feel the emotions of what they're doing for the drones. Very controversial. A game designer will also help you understand that procedural media is the future, and it's the way that we're going to get to Westworld. Um, the era of Soren over California with stock footage is over. That's not exciting anymore. Um, what if instead you're soaring over a procedurally generated dreamscape, a terrain that was just made just for you by the data that your watch got when you were sleeping at night, your sleep patterns generated a terrain procedurally, and you get your own soaring ride through a game engine. That's not possible with pre-rendered media. And this media pipeline is completely different, and this is going to be the biggest adjustment for everyone in this industry. Um, who knows how to make media and integrate media for attractions, pre-rendered media is going to be phased out. And you're going to be getting photo real media uh, that's procedural and generated on the fly. And it's a completely different skill set, but it is the way that we're going to get there. Um, and lastly, uh, I'm going to wrap up with uh, one more clip from the show on a more serious note. Um, in the first talk yesterday, Danny Byerly talked about immersion as a catalyst for transformation. That was a phrase that I really liked, immersion as a catalyst for transformation. And with that in mind, I'm going to play one more clip from the show. This is from the first episode of the new Westworld show. And that narrative designer character, who I mentioned earlier, has just pitched his idea for a new narrative to the owner-operator of the park, sort of the Walt Disney analog character. And we're going to watch the owner giving his feedback on the narrative. The guests don't return for the obvious things we do, the garish things. They come back because of the subtleties, the details. They come back because they discover something they imagined no one had ever noticed before. Something they fall in love with. They're not looking for a story that tells them who they are. They already know who they are. They're here because they want a glimpse of who they could be. 
Billy, let's go. The only thing your story tells me, Mr. Sizemore, is who you are. Or isn't there anything you like about it? <laughs> what size are those boots? <laughs> wow. Well, thank you. Thank you, Michael. So I had a quick question for you. Um, you know, we had some conversations, you know, preparing for this about procedural storytelling, about using uh, a computer to create the storylines or manage the storylines. Are there any examples of that that you can point to that are working today outside of video games? Or, and how far away do you think we are from creation of a, of a place like Westworld? Oh boy, well, um, probably the best example of procedural narrative I've seen, uh, you folks should all look this up, it's this thing called the Wilderness Downtown. Has anybody heard of this? Anyone out there? Wilderness Downtown? Great, okay, good. So um, look it up, no, no, this is, this is good. Uh, so it is a music video for the Arcade Fire, except it's not a video. You, uh, this was done in 2010, using uh, Google Maps and JavaScript and HTML5, and it's a music video, and you go onto the web, and you enter your childhood home address, and it procedurally creates this music video oh my God. that flies over your home where you grew up and your street and places near you, and it's this intense, personalized, nostalgic video that's actually the same procedural story for everyone, but it's using their own home and their memories and childhood, and it's incredibly powerful, so. And how far away do you think we are from creating a Westworld? Um, well, I think in terms of the back-end technology, we're actually there. Um, it has to do now with, you know, the photorealism of the media and the advances in the animatronics, but in terms of, you know, the IT aspect, it's, it's happening now because the, the difference between open world video games like Grand Theft Auto and you know, Warcraft and things like that. The only difference between that and theme parks is building it, actually building it, constructing it. Um, but those things are already happening in video games. Right. All right. Amazing. Well, we have a couple of questions for the panel, just in, in general, that we'd want to, uh, we're going to start off with the, with the ethics around um, doing something like Westworld. And Jeff, we're going to start off with you. You've been immersed in Haunt. We're in that season. Um, you know, we, we have a, a, a responsibility, or maybe we don't, um, for the content that we create. Um, wondering, you know, one of the themes of the show is is that these violent delights may have violent ends. And if you look at some of the kind of graphic things that are in Haunt, I mean, are we, are we, is there something there that, you know, we're leading people uh, to kind of violent ends? Yeah, well, I, I pitched some ideas that were met with kind of skepticism. Uh, because I was at the, the third year we did Trapped, we were trying to soften the blow of the upcharge on it. So we were giving them a commemorative photo in the lobby. And I thought, well, we're taking their picture. What if next year we took that picture and actually used it against them in the maze later <laughs> by taking it and, and projecting it on the walls, gouging the eyes out, having blood come out. And instead of the victim being some unknown person, it's you. And then I said, well, we also talked about giving them some sort of aptitude test before they came in, which means that we'd have 10 minutes with them before they entered the maze proper. And that's enough time, because I, uh, I uh, for, well, at one point, was in charge of the usher department at Knott's Berry Farm, which is all like 15, uh, 16, 17-year-old kids. 10 minutes on the internet, we can know everything about you. These guys know everything. Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, you name it. And I thought, well, we'll just use all that information against them in the maze. We'll print out pictures of their dog and their mom and their house. And by the third room, it's no longer like a fun 
haunted house where we don't know what's going to happen. It's, that's a picture of my bedroom. <laughs> and um, the powers that be said, Jeff, that might be illegal. <laughs> <laughs> so unfortunately, it never came to fruition. But the technology is, I mean, it, it is already there. They do have these one-on-one -on -one experiences you can have where you're, you're voluntarily, like Michael Douglas in the game, giving them all of your information that then they are going to use against you. Phone calls and tweets and texts and all that. I just wanted to do it in a way that was uh, cloak and dagger, but it, it, it wasn't going to happen. It's way too... We, we, we did a thing where we tell guests, if, if it's too intense, you can say boysenberry, and it will end, it will throw you out. It's a safe word. And I thought, well, no one's going to use it because they paid $60. We had people using it in the first room. <laughs> and I would go in as like... Like in Westworld, like I would step in as Anthony Hopkins and go, we want you to have a good time here. <laughs> Perhaps you could, maybe you didn't say it and I'll take you in, it'll be fine. And some people just weren't having it. So yeah, there is that, that line that you just can't cross yet. Here's the thing though, you're talking about my generation. My generation is like, I don't want to be bothered to someone at the door as a telemarketer, no. The new generation says, my entire life's on the internet. <laughs> Take it, I'm gonna show you what I had for breakfast. Right. <laughs> so we're gonna move into that position very quickly because my, I've got kids. They'll, I, if I step into a restaurant, five minutes later, I look at my phone, I've been checked in. And I'm like, well, I didn't check myself in, well, my kids did. So <laughs> that, the next generation will be the ones who are going to fully accept this kind of immersion and this kind of what I would call intrusiveness. So right. we'll see. Yeah. And uh, Steve, what do you think about the kind of ethical issues around, you know, creating AI or machine learning to the point of a West world? Well, uh, at some level, I think it's moot. Basically, the, the, the genie is out of the bottle. We're, uh, billions of dollars are being spent. Thousands, tens of thousands of people are working on this. It's going to take us a while, but it's going to happen whether it's ethical or not. Uh, so so uh, I, I, I'm... I, I guess a technology optimist in that I see it as possible, and a, an ethics pessimist in that I, I think the consequences could be dire ultimately. And what do you mean by that? I'm well, I, I guess I do subscribe to those who think that once we have systems that are sufficiently intelligent to be interesting, and we're not there, and we're not close to that yet, but once we have systems that are interestingly intelligent and interestingly more intelligent than we are, I think we become less and less interesting to them. So. Uh, all right. All right. Well, that's the scary end of that story. <laughs> well, listen, I'm afraid we had like a million more things we wanted to discuss, and this topic is obviously going to continue on for quite some time, but I, we're, we're getting that we need to wrap it up. But listen, thank you so much to all our panels for coming out. This has been so fantastic. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Over to the TEA. Amazing. We're having such a good time. So I'm afraid that's it for us. So adios.